figure how much effort it took a half a million years ago to survive and thrive up to the point of being able to get lazy. We piled up the caves into skyscrapers and went from shifting through foliage to shifting through administration forms, but the effort feels the same. The outcome still dependent on which branch you're born on, fall off or aspire to. And the question of survival to what end hasn't gone away, nor all the littler questions that it comprises. Is it maybe that along with the knowledge, our genes also carry the data of all the ancestral disgust amassed over centuries of famine, war, pestilence and folly? The terror of seeing your like selves ripped to shreds by a saber-toothed tiger while you're tripping on some half-edible root still plays in the background of every horror movie the fear mongers cash in on, along with every frightened or frightening reflection ever since. We evolve by amassing information and finding lazier ways to process and act on them over centuries. And it shows clearly that by amassing humans in a more or less coherent pattern of thought and behavior, the singing chords augment that reality, that malady, which then becomes their life song and shows an evolution, a changing cadence perhaps, a need for improvisation within the team until two themes collide on the fringes and merge never seamlessly but needed and natural, like running brooks jumping down the mountain whilst they inscribe their way in the rocks, leaving a stone-carved truth in their wake. And so it's a plausible trend to notice that since we started gathering stones to build caves on a plain, as a resting spot for the elderly, sick, fed up, pregnant nomads that stopped wandering while the tribe moved on, and since after that other tribes passed and mingled, pruning and grooming each other, and the layout of villages gave the nomadic wandering a specific grid between the places of reap, hunt and harvest. And with the amassing of people came the mass of goods and the increase of mutual dependency and therefore the resurgence of the tribal form, but this time by skill and property. And so tribes mixed and classes formed. Along with the root of our civilizations, we, ra we laid the seeds for our current day-to-day -day problems of sustainability as the human population forces itself into urban copycat lives. For one day an old nomad stood out in a city he had long ago unknowingly started, and he stood out. Where their roots lay on the roads and myriad waterways of the world, the city dwellers had engaged in the localized idea of worth and value and thus few, few outlook on life that allowed for local variations, but less and less for things and beings outside the system of self-organization life form that it had become. He smelled the city long before he could see it, and in the streets his own smell seemed to evaporate and mingle with that of a thousand bodies, cattle, pigs, wine, food and vermin. Lost in the crowd as if it were a forest or a steppe, a plunge into the depths of the avalanche, singing with a million voices like crickets, frogs, birds and beasts as it thunders through the crevices of your mind till the rumbling in your skull caves makes you feel the wildebeest urge to stampede, the goat's defiant need to climb, the lizard's tongue flashing across your palate to frantically smell the way out, through and over this crowd, the synonymousness. It's such a transgression in the mind, such a threshold. That transgression from a closed group to small mixed group to anomalies that nobody for sure knows to which group they belong because the numbers got too large and borrowing each other's toes and fingers to keep track of a body count is simply not practical. And so in laziness, we reluctantly accept the neutral unknowns in our societies now as then. Then is it this neurality, neutrality, neuro-reality that gave rise to the idea and habit of indifference as normality? No sudden movements never show your back? Never look them in the eye. The way to deal with ape encounters turns out the way to be the way people treat each other on the streets. I enjoy greeting as we pass. I enjoy looking at people same way I enjoy architecture, trees, wildlife, or spontaneously emergent patterns rippling through the air. But often it's a mutual shock that they don't like it. Because to me it's all stories, life songs, dying leaves and sprouting blossoms. Each human being in his very own season of life. To them, however, I'm not an observer but an actor and my actions aren't neutral but lightly engaging and thus an opening to the great unknown. The, cyber the saber-toothed tiger flashes across the screen and a gorilla pounces his chest grumbling, hey man, what you watching? So then you start to observe whether the people you pass are observant as well. 
and observing people becomes a thing, an item, a need derived from studying the flock before deciding which animal would be feasted upon and which would trample you to death or worse, sustained agony. The agony of the need for constant observance called into action now not just to hunt, but to protect groups larger than ever before. Herds of humans so big you don't exactly know what and who or how many you're protecting, and you end up standing vanguard for the greater cause. Birth of the unknown soldier that still dies today, every day. Standing guard became a job, a calling, a profession. Only when others decided they had more important things to do than take their turn gazing out over the edge with the neuro switch constantly hovering over no danger, possible danger, fear of death or worse, falling asleep on the job or following a thread of thoughts into oblivion while a man with a saber-toothed tiger mask sides up against you. Ah!